So today we're going to be taking a look at two different broadcast microphones. For many, they are seated as champions in the world of broadcast microphones. First off, we have the Shure SM7B. For most people, this is the king of broadcast microphones, not only just for its broadcasting capabilities, but also for its vocal capabilities, made famous by Michael Jackson in Thriller, or not in Thriller, when he recorded Thriller. This is the type of microphone he used, the Shure SM7B. So we're going to call this one the king, the champion of broadcast microphones. And the mic I'm speaking into right now is what I call the champion of budget broadcast microphones, the MXL BCD1, an amazing mic for the price, 132 bucks. If you're watching this video, it's probably not to get specs on both of these mics. You've probably already done that, but it's probably trying to figure out, is it worth spending the extra about out $250 to get the Shure over the MXL. This one is about $132 uh, on Amazon, and I'll put links to all this in the description below. The Shure sells for about $400. So it is, is it worth the extra cash? Let's find out. So the question of is the SM7B worth the extra money really just boils down to a couple questions. First off, do you think it sounds better? And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to answer that question. We're going to do that by doing a quick reading out of a book that I'm really falling in love with. It's called The Birth of Loud. This is the Les Paul and Leo Fender story. It's a really cool book. We're going to just do a couple page reading out of this so you can hear both of the microphones. Um, and also, if you're interested in this book, I'll put a link to it in the description below. You should really check it out if you're into music history. And then past the sound are just some general functional items. So both of these mics being broadcast mics are front address microphones. They also both have internal shock mounts. Now, the Shure, as you can see, actually has a pop filter that it comes with attached to it. And most of the time you see the Shure, it looks just like this. This pop filter actually does come off. The MXL BCD1 did come with a foam pop filter on that. Um, I'm addressing it at an angle, so hopefully I'm not getting too many plosives here um, because my kids tore up the pop filter. And I've used this mic a lot without it, but it is something to keep in uh, keep in the back of your head that if you do want the MXL, you are going to have to make sure you have some sort of pop filter there. Now, that's not a big deal. Those are not all that expensive, but it's just something to think about. The other thing is that the Shure SM7B is a much bigger microphone physically than the MXL BCD1. So if you're traveling a lot with it, it does add, the Shure does add quite a bit more weight than the MXL mic does. Also, if you're traveling, you know, when I'm traveling doing something, I will always take the MXL. Uh, now, this is a Shure that I own. So I own both these microphones. This is not like a borrowed mic or I'm not buying this from Sweetwater and returning it in 10 days or any of that stuff. I own this mic. The MXL I also own and I also travel with it because I figure if it gets lost, stolen, broken, it's $132 versus $400. And really the sound quality, um, I believe, is right on par. I've gotten a lot of compliments about this mic. The other thing to keep in mind is just really the the hotness of the mic. The Shure is notorious for needing a lot of juice to get uh, to get to the level you want it to be at. So we're right now plugged into a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 third gen. So this is one of the brand new ones. And I'm getting a pretty good signal. I'm looking at the audio recording software over there. I'm getting a pretty good signal out of this BCD1. Now, I'm not going to touch anything. I'm just going to unplug the BCD1 and plug it into the shore. And you're going to see how far down this level drops. So now we are in the shore SM7B, and I can tell you can probably barely hear this on YouTube. Um, I'm looking over at my audio software, and the waves are very, very small. So I'm not going to do this very long. I just wanted to give you an example of how much extra gain you're going to have to give this mic to be able to actually hear it. Now, during the reading, I am going to push the gain on this mic so that you can hear it at a similar level. But once again, this is just one of those things. There's a, a product called a cloud lifter that I'll also put in the description below that most people add to the shore to be able to get those levels where they need them. So something else to keep in mind, if you go with the shore, you may actually have to spend a couple hundred bucks extra to get something like a cloud lifter, really depending on your... Now, hold on. You're probably having a hard time hearing this. Let me switch over back to the MXL so I can tell you the rest of the story. 
So like I was saying, <laughs> now in normal volumes here, um, with the with the Shure SM7B, you may find that you have to buy another piece of equipment depending on the audio interface you have to be able to get the mic to a level that you need it at. Now I have found with the Focusrite Scarlet stuff, I do have to push the device, but I can normally get it where I need it to go. Uh, that's just my own personal opinion and personal, you know, what I'm doing. But you might find that you might buy this and now you need to buy a cloud lifter and that's some more money out of your pocket. So if you did need to buy a cloud lifter or some other device like that, a pre, something like that, then all of a sudden the budget, the difference in the price of these two mics to get them to actually function for you actually becomes much wider. So that's definitely something to think about. Now, at the end of the day, the reality is you can't go wrong with either of these mics. They're both amazing microphones. Um, I just really, you know, with the Shure, there is something about it being the Shure SM7B. So if you showed up to a recording session and you were recording somebody's vocals or you were doing, you know, some YouTube videos where you have a talking head with a broadcast mic, yes, there's definitely something about just the the um the mojo that the shore brings to it and i don't want to take away from that there's a re there's a a mental reality to that that when people see certain gear they see certain things it does do something mentally and so there's a value to that there's no doubt about that but the question is is it a 250 dollar value uh, we'll make that up to you and let me know in the comments below what you think which mic would you choose with that being said let's go ahead and uh, get some reading in on Sunday afternoons, Les Paul would bolt awake in his apartment in Queens and rush across the East River into Manhattan. There was something he needed to build, something he could only build there. It was never in the mornings, because Les Paul was allergic to mornings. It had to be in the afternoons, after Les had time to sleep off the previous nights, those rabid jazz jam sessions up in Harlem or on 52nd Street, and the big band swing concerts he sometimes played before them. Sundays were often the only day of the week when Les didn't have a rehearsal or a radio concert or a live gig. He could have spent them with his family, with the wife he'd brought to New York from Chicago, the woman who was about to have his first child, but Les Paul had a sound in his head that needed to get out. After rising well into the middle of the day, he'd throw on some rumpled clothes, dash alone out of his tiny apartment, and barrel back across the 59th Street Bridge toward the same crowded, smoky island from which he'd just returned a few hours earlier. He'd nose his sedan down through the clogged avenues of Manhattan to 14th Street, where a proud Renaissance Revival building stood near the corner of 17th Avenue its upper floors occupied by the Epiphone Stringed Instrument Factory. The factory was closed on Sundays, but Les had made an arrangement with the owner when the lanky 27-year-old approached those stately front doors and flashed his goofy smile, a watchman let him in and showed him upstairs. The guard turned on the lights and the lathes and the sanders in the empty workshop and demonstrated how they worked. Then he left Les Paul alone inside that cavernous room, left him to build a tool that could create the sound Les heard in his head. Les had been hearing the sound for almost half his life, ever since he was a kid playing hillbilly tunes and telling cornball jokes to anyone in Wisconsin who'd listen. As a child, he'd torn apart and reassembled his mother Evelyn's player piano, her telephone, her phonograph, even her electric light switches. He adored radio, loved listening to the Grand Old Opry with Evelyn, a devoted country fan, Loved building a simple earpiece radio. Loved tinkering with a fancier receiver he shared with a friend. Born on June 9, 1915, to a mother who adored and spoiled him from the start, Les had picked up the harmonica at age 8, discovering by accident that he could make it sound better by soaking it in boiling water. So there you go. Now you've heard both of these microphones. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. If you've enjoyed hanging out, would you consider hitting that subscribe button? I'm B-Side, and we'll talk to you next time.